You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Nothing is more impressive than a person who is secure in the unique way God made her. And that quote is to anonymous. You gotta really get to know yourself and love and treasure just who you are. Welcome to this morning, May. Oh my God, I was I was at a cafe recently and somebody said this year is blowing by, and then I said, you know, I don't know if it's when your kids get older and they're in higher grades or out of school that it just seems like life goes so fast. But it it is already we coming down to the end of May, and I'm like, where did May go? I want to welcome you to our May the 25th show, and hope you all are enjoying late spring as we get ready to kick off in the summer. Where we are in southeast Tennessee, they have what they call cicadas. These insects, they make a lot of noise, and they fly so high. They can fly so high up in the air. And they they, they come out every 13 years and every 17 years. This year, the first time in over 200 years, they both came out. They are, like, everywhere. But I think it's only, like, in the southeast and some of the Midwest states, like Illinois. But have fun. They say they're harmless. They say they're harmless. They put nutrients in the ground. So uh, I guess all, all good. But enjoy your sick of their time. And so before we kick off this morning, the the the, the show today, I got to ask you how good of a mystery sleuth are you? Do you just love a mystery? I love to watch them on TV. I love to read a good mystery novel. If you love a mystery, and I like a complicated mystery, with a, with you, it takes you a while to even see the real motive or what really happened. I actually just watched one last night. I encourage you to get a copy of Spiral. It's set in the 1940s. Oh, my goodness. You will be shocked at the ending. I mean floored. So I encourage you to get a spiral, a copy of Spiral by Denise Turney. If you love a good mystery, you can get an ebook, paperback, and hardback. Spiral, S P I R A L. And tell me how you like the story and if the ending shocks you. I bet you don't see it coming. And now let us go and meet our very special off the shelf guest. And today's off the shelf guest is. And I hope she corrects me. Mary Kalia Koa. And Mary is the author of the mystery book, Hidden Pieces, the first book in the Misty Pine series. Other books in the series include Deadly Tides and Don't Ask, Don't Follow. Early in her career, Mary worked as a legal secretary. I bet you that gave her a lot of material. Mary's work has either been nominated for or won numerous book awards including the Hamas and Lafty and Agatha and Anthony Award. Not only does Mary write mystery, she loves legal th- thrillers, especially digging into what makes a person tick. I encourage you to check Mary out online at marykaleacoa.com. And, yes, I'm going to spell that, M-A-R-Y-K-E-L-I-I-K-O-A.com. And again, M A R Y K E L I I K O A dot com. We are just so excited and honored to have Mary Kalia Koa join us on Off the Shelf Books this morning. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Mary. Hi, Denise. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And you did great on my name. It's Kelly Ito. Oh, oh my you did goodness. Great. I, I was when I was in the Navy. I was stationed in Hawaii. I was on. I, I was stationed on Oahu, but I also visited Maui, and it made me think of a Hawaiian name. When it, it was is it, definitely the way in Hawaii. My very husband. <laughs> yeah, the way it's spelled. So it is just a pleasure to have you on now. To the first few sh- uh, questions I'm going to ask you, I ask every guest on the show. Just so our listeners can get a little backstory on the guests before I start talking about their books and and their other work. So to kick off today's show, Mary, will you please tell off the shelf listeners where you grew up 
and what life was like for you growing up. Yeah, so I am a fisherman's daughter. That's what I like to always say. My dad was a charter fisherman out down at the Oregon coast. Um, so even though I was born in Portland, which is kind of a city, uh, within no time we migrated down to the coast and um, we lived in a little trailer park and my dad would go out at 4 o'clock in the morning and, and do his charter fishing and my brother and I uh, would run down to the docks to watch the boats come in each afternoon, uh, watch the fish come off the boats and that's, you know, the Oregon coast was such a great place to to fill a kid's imagination with lots of fun stuff. So that was my beginning. Um, and then we moved up into Portland as the fishing industry tended to have its issues and um, it was harder to make a living. And I grew up closer into the Portland suburbs. And then eventually we grew up in the country. Uh, I went out to a place called Sherwood, Oregon, which is just a little little country town and grew up on five acres surrounded by cows and horses and trail riding and Lots of fun stuff. <laughs> so, oh my that was God, kind of my childhood. So, are siblings, siblings, or are you only child? Well, I have four. Um, I have, and so we kind of had two sets. There was my older brother and sister, who were thirteen and fourteen years older than I than I am, and then my brother, who was right next to me. Uh, we kind of grew up almost separately because they were out of the house by the time we came in, and and grew up. Um, I lost my brother that was my age, but uh, but yeah, so there's just my sister and I out of the, the four of us. But yeah, there are four. Okay, okay. I, you know, Portland is a city that I, I've heard has changed so much. And then, uh, yeah. but growing up on a farm, when I was a kid, I used to want to grow up on a farm, the, the open land. <laughs> my grandmother said, it's a lot of work. And I, another woman who I, I I saw it at the Italian People's Bakery when I was living in uh, New, Jer- uh, New Jersey, working in New, Jer- New Jersey. She was 84 and looked 50. I said, how do you stay so young? <laughs> and she said, she, you, working, just oh, you got to keep working and keep learning, And but you got to do work you love. And she grew up on a farm, and she said, man, that mm-hmm. was work. <laughs> It, yes. it really was. It really was. Yeah, a lot of work. I, you know, lucky I, I was on what they call more of a hobby farm where my dad and mom didn't really raise lots of animals. We, we had a cow and you know different things, but, but around me, around, you know, I had a neighbor, my best friend, her family did sheep, you know, and then another did cattle, and so that it was all around us, and that was, you know, so not a, quite as hard of work for me, but definitely for some yeah, of my friends. Yeah, just the open so. land. It just it seemed like a very peaceful, relaxing environment to be oh, in. Now, when, yeah. when you were a young girl, what did you dream of being when you grew up? What did you want to be? I wanted to be a dancer and a teacher. That was my dream. <sighs> I, I danced through the house all the time, my mother said, and I was always reading her a a book when I was young, um, always trying to, you know, she'd cook dinner and I'd be reading to her. Um, and I always thought I'd be a teacher, but that just, it neither happened, <laughs> so, which is fine. I got into the legal field instead, a little bit of a departure, but life happens and sometimes you have to um, make a living, right? Pay your bills. And so I didn't get the opportunity to go to college or do any of that. So I, I started working right out of high school. And um, so I got right into the legal field, but I, you know, I was, I was always wanting to dance, and I still dance around the house, so that hasn't really changed much. Okay. <laughs> you know, so many people who have been on, we've been on 18 years, so many people who have been on off the shelf, that they, they, what they dreamed of being and what they actually did is so different. I, I, and that's something to me personally I, I'm to, is to explore. Maybe I'll write a book where I interview people and then ask them later, yeah. do you think the original dream is what you were meant to do, and yet you would feel for, for more fulfilled, not that you don't now, as a person, whoever I would be talking to, but more so yeah. if you had followed that initial, what you, we talk ourselves out of so much stuff, uh, but good for oh you, you're still gosh. there, yeah. and then do your writings, you can be teaching, you know, so next question, who or what inspired your love for writing and books, for writing books, where did that yeah. come from? Right. Yeah, so I'm a late bloomer when it came to writing books. Um, I love to read, and 
I ended up really kind of gravitating toward more fantasy when I was in high school. Um, I liked, you know, Jean Al. I liked J.R. Tolkien books. Um, so I, I really didn't find my love of mystery until I graduated. And then I started reading Mary Higgins Clark and J.A. E. Jantz and Sue Grafton. And those were type, those were the, Faye Kellerman. Those were the books that I gravitated towards. And it wasn't until I was about 27 that I decided I actually wanted to write. Uh, my girlfriend sitting next to me at the law firm said, I want to write a mystery novel. And I was like, well, we, we have an hour a day at lunch, so maybe we could, you know, sit here and, you know, brainstorm a mystery uh, book. And so that's what we did. And I never really thought of myself as a writer. Um, I thought of myself as just somebody who loved mystery books. Uh, but once I started writing, I, you know, then it was part of my, I found out it was in my DNA and that's what I really wanted to do. And and so that's I've been doing that, and I'll be fifty nine this summer. So you know I've been good for you. Doing it a good while. for you. <laughs> now, now before we start talking about your books, just just a couple of other questions. Now I always heard that being a legal secretary was really a tough gig. So the first question is, is it tough? And what was it like working as a legal secretary? Yeah, um, well, it is. You know, it's it's got a lot of working parts to it. I guess it would be the same as if you were a medical secretary, right? It, there's a lot of jargon that you have to learn. There's a lot of rules that you have to know um, through the court systems. And I was in a litigation secretary and a paralegal, so I did a little bit of both aspects. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot of running to the courthouse right before 5 o'clock to get something filed. It's making sure you don't screw up the timelines because if you do, your your boss could end up with a malpractice lawsuit. You know, you have a lot of weight on your shoulders to make sure everything is on the docket, on the calendar and that. So, it can be high pressure. It kind of depends on the area of law that you're you're doing. Um, if you're doing corporate law, you know, it's a whole different set of, of circumstances than if you're doing litigation and you have a trial starting Monday morning. So, um, and that's what I did. And I liked the pressure cooker. So, you know, it, it fit my personality because I'm kind of a go, go, go type of person. Um, and so that fit. It may not fit for everybody. But, you know, it's a good, it's a very respectable field. It uh, pays well, good benefits usually. And so I had to have fun as well. Okay. So. Now, how did yeah. you, so you, your cases you already told us, was there, what, I have to ask you, did you get any, were there any cases did you ever start paying attention? Let me say this. Did there any cases ever jump out at you that you thought you could turn into a great mystery? And were you writing mystery novels while you were working as a legal secretary? Uh, yeah. So, yes, I was. I was. That's when I did a lot of my early writing. Um, no cases really jumped out completely, but characters definitely did. In, that, in fact, my very first series that I ever wrote and debuted with was a PI series. And part of that was born out of dealing with different private investigators in our line of work because, you know, we did we would do car accident and different, you know, accident reconstructions and that type of law is what we were doing litigation on. And so private eyes would come through and, and I'd get to talk to them occasionally as they were doing different interviews outside of our offices. And that's what inspired me, you know, kind of to, to gravitate towards that PI. And so not a specific case, but the the different characters that I would meet through, you know, um, through the through my work definitely was inspiring. Can you share two things? You said you, the, the, the people for characters. Can you share two things you learned about humans while working in law, two traits that reveal, that just show up in people? It doesn't matter the background, the demographic that show up in people time and again, that people mm. vow, they swear, I am not like this, I am not like this. <laughs> I don't know, they probably are. Are the two traits that you just keep seeing, they just keep showing up and who, it doesn't matter who the person is, they just show up. Oh, gosh, what a, that's a great question. Um, well, I think inherently most people want to win. Uh, that's what I wow. saw a lot of. And sometimes people are willing to do lots of different, you know, borderline things to make sure that they, that they do. Um, mm. I, I would say that, you know, they're willing to kind of skirt sometimes or maybe not fully expand on the situation to make themselves look a little bit better. I think, you know, owning self-responsibility and owning up 
sometimes were issues that you see quite a bit in, especially in a situation where you're suing people and, you know, litigating and, you know. So I'm not sure that's two, but yeah, that was kind of, you know, kind of an people inherent want to thing win. with all the people. Interesting. People mm-hmm. want to win. It's self-protection. That's self-protection, mm-hmm. man, that you see that show up. And pe- Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. You know, yeah. and as a writer, if somebody's writing a mystery or anything, well, motive is a key part of the story. That's something oh, yeah. to keep in mind, the, that trait. Now, yeah. do you think working, is that what attracted you to mi- writing mystery th- thrillers, that working as a legal secretary? What attracted you, if not, what attracted you to this specific genre? I think, you know, I love puzzles all to, I've always loved puzzles, right? You can find me every night filling out, you know, doing a puzzle, a crossword puzzle or something. Um, but I really liked, like what you just were talking about was motivation. I really love to see what makes people tick. And, of course, you can see that in any genre, whether it's, you know, science fiction or romance or literary. Of course, you see that everywhere. But when you have a mystery or a suspense genre, you're really kind of looking at that darker side of what has made somebody do what they did or protect somebody that they that they love or, you know, there's these deeper motivations. Um, and they're a great place to, to look at redemption stories. There's, a, you know, it's just a great place to just explore emotion. I, you know, I think that's just really what brought me into it. And, of course, the puzzle at the end of the day, you know, who did do it and why did they do it? Um, it, it just keeps my brain active and, and it really works for me. I love the suspense and the mystery genre. Okay. Please give us an, a brief overview of Hidden Pieces. Well, Hidden Pieces is actually the first book in my Misty Pine series. And Don't Ask, Don't Fall, I wanted to correct was, it's actually, that's a standalone. That's my new one coming out next, or June 4th. So, okay. my, but I have two series, and the first series is Hidden Pieces. And um, that one is centers around Sheriff Jax Turner, and it is set down at the Oregon coast, of which I knew so well. Um, the Oregon coast is such a great character all on its own. You know, it's just a very atmospheric place. Um, But it was actually inspired by a true crime in my hometown where a young girl had, um, she was in the class behind me, she'd been out walking with a friend, a car stopped and abducted her. The other girl ran and um, Charmel actually was murdered and found down at the Oregon coast. And I was 14 at the time, yeah, that that happened. And it was one of those things that changed all the girls in our community that day, right? Because we all walked those country roads to go oh, home from school or if we missed the bus or whatever, we'd always do that. And so I would had that, of course, kind of in my psyche for a long time, you know, just holding on to that and, and that fear around walking country roads, all that kind of stuff. So when I sat down to write a book about the Oregon coast, that story kind of resonated. And so I created a character, Sheriff Jax Turner, who was going to be strong enough to run the town. And then I gave him that as a cold case, something that continued to eat at him because he'd never solved it. And then I gave him a current case to kind of mirror that old case. And so that that's what inspired the series. And book one, Hidden Pieces, is, you know, the story of, of how he solved that crime ultimately. So, wow. Yeah. And, now, it shares Jax Turner. You spoke about him briefly. First of all, oh, my God, just even to have experienced that personally, it's like, oh, my yeah. goodness. Is Sheriff Jax Turner is the one character who shows up in each book in the series? Yeah, so he's also in Deadly Tide, um, which is the book that came out last October. And he gets to um, solve a case parallel to his ex-wife, Abby Kanakoa, um, and she's FBI agent. And so we we get to see more of Jax. And I'm actually working on the third book in the series right now, which is Killer Tracks. That'll be out next year. So that, and again, it's Abby and Jax kind of moving along and a new a new addition to the legal family. <laughs> how so, many books do um, you, I wasn't going to ask you this, but just how many books do you work on at once? Are you like, are you, do you work on one book at a time or are you juggling two or more books at the same time writing them? Yeah, so 
I would like to say that I could do, I could be a good juggler, but I'm not. My brain works, you know, I'm pretty, when I get into a story, I kind of live and breathe the story as I'm writing it. Uh, like it's always on my mind. I wake up thinking about it. I go to bed thinking about it. So I'm a one, one at a time person, generally speaking. So, um, okay. so right now I'm trying to get killer tracks finished up. <laughs> You're just a, a, a fast then, writer. What, what is happening? Oh, can you, well, before I ask that. Can you describe, we're talking about characters, I think characters drive a story. If readers don't care about a character, I don't really care what's happening. It's like I don't care what happens to this person, so they're not really into the story, even if there's a lot of action or whatever in it. Can you give us a closer a glimpse, a closer view of Jax Turner? What's his personality like? Is he fun? Is he of humor? Is he a loner? Does he like be around a lot of people? Uh, is he a married, single What's he like here? Can you give us a, a, a more of an inside view of uh, Sheriff Jack? Yeah. yeah, so Jack's, you know, he's he's in his 50s, and he, he's, he didn't have a great relationship with his father, and his mother kind of abandoned him and his father when he was a little bit younger. So he... Um, He's been a very self-driven, self-critical type of guy for a lot of his life. Not quite sure he measured up. I mean, if your mom leaves you, it kind of makes you think, maybe I wasn't good enough to stick around for. And so he has a little bit of that lie going on in his head that it was about him. Um, and he always wanted his dad's approval, so he, he got into the Navy early on. And, of course, his dad dies before he even really gets to be proud of him. So. Jax is kind of always looking for some of that redemption, um, that he's okay and, and that. And as you meet Jax at the beginning of Hidden Pieces, um, he's actually contemplating uh, suicide. And he starts oh, at a very, wow. very dark place in the book, yeah. But the reason why he's done that is because he he's lost his daughter, Lulu, uh, who was five, to leukemia. And it's a, oh. a, shortly after he lost his wife. And so he thinks that he has this inability to get it right. And so he finds himself at a really dark place until he gets a phone call that a 14-year-old girl has gone missing. And he thinks now is my chance maybe to get it right this time. Because he remember, he's got that old case from 25 years ago of the missing girl that, that dies, and he couldn't save her, and therefore he believes that you know, he, there's just lots of things that have piled up on him over the years, right? So, but that phone call drags him back, and he thinks, well, you know, if I'm going to solve a case, this is this is the one to do it. Maybe I'll be back on this beach to end it all in a day or two. But, but once he finds his focus and he finds his purpose again, um, of course, he doesn't go back to that beach, and and he does much better. So, um, and throughout the book, he is. Um, trying to get Abby, his ex-wife, back. He's found himself mm. again, and then when he's, because he's found himself, he believes that he he can try to heal that relationship. And so that's also a sub, you know, um, plot going on throughout the novel as well. Oh my so, goodness! Yeah, he's a I likable love guy. You layer your stories <laughs> and your characters. <laughs> Introduce us, please, to a few other major and minor characters in hidden pieces. People who help. Uh, the, the book, and tell us the ones who are going to make an appearance in each book in the series to help it. readers just stay glued to the pages. Yeah. Yeah, well, Abby, of course, is his ex-wife, and she she plays a, a little bit minor role in the first book. She's like his obstacle to get over, right, because she's FBI, and they happen to have a case that's crossing, and She's got her agenda, and he's got his agenda, and they're not necessarily matching. Um, and so you, you, that's where you get to meet her. Um, and she doesn't trust Jax. You know, Jax kind of abandoned her emotionally when Lulu died. And so as he's kind of making qualms about, you know, maybe we could try this again, she's like, oh, no. <laughs> you, tried, you tried. We did this, and you weren't there when I needed you. And that really plays out in the second book a lot more, but – you see that in the first book. So I love Abby, though, because um, she's a strong woman, and she knows what she wants to a large degree, and um, and we get to see her grow a lot throughout the um, the whole series, actually. In Deadly Tide, she's actually dealing with her mom, who's got Alzheimer's, and 
And, uh, you know, so you really get to see different aspects of her. Um, and I love Trudy. Trudy is the um, office secretary mom who basically corrals, and she's like herding cats all the time, right? So she's trying to take care of Jax and tell him what to do and to quit being a, you know, um, an oblivious man, <laughs> you know, like, come on, pay attention. You're getting, these are the signals. You're not, you're not paying attention. Um, and so I love Trudy and she's probably one of my favorite characters that I've written in the series. Um, so yeah. And then, uh, and then in hidden pieces, I'm trying to keep it specific. Um, the whole team is actually great, you know, because Jax doesn't work all on his own. He's got a team of young deputies he works with and, um, he's, proving to having to teach them the ropes. And I think that's part, a strength and a weakness for him sometimes. So. Is this a small town? It is. Misty Pines. Oh, so yes. so we're talking a town of, what, 10,000 people? Where everybody really knows oh, everybody? Yes, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. And, in, and I, it is a fictional town, but it is based on the area I grew up in. I I needed some creative license. I needed a little bit more, uh, you know, square footage to work in. <laughs> so, okay. So let me uh, ask you this. Yeah, it's been a bit. So Jax is inve- when Jax is investigating this first missing girl, he's not married and doesn't have kids yet. He's younger, correct? Uh, right. Yeah, the 25-year-old case, yes. Uh, okay, so then he, has, he gets married, he has a daughter, his daughter passes, does he link those two? Like, does he hold himself responsible for both? And has he given, forgiven himself at the start of Hidden Pieces? Has he forgiven himself for his daughter passing? No. No, he thinks he should have caught that. And, I, you know, I think that weighs on him, um, that he couldn't save her. He has kind of that hero complex where he believes that if he just tries hard enough that he can somehow – fix it all. And, you know, that 25-year-old case shows that he, he wasn't Superman. And the fact that he loses Lulu, um, you know, is also just one more thing that breaks him that he was not able to save his daughter, um, even though he tried so hard to. And then because of that, then he, you know, withdraws and then he loses Abby because also because he's not emotionally there for his wife at the time that she needs him most. So, you know, he has a little bit of a hill to climb to get trust back and to find himself. And um, But the case that he is handed at the beginning of Hidden Pieces, it's really his redemption story. I mean, that's really what the, the book is about, is finding his way back to himself uh, and a, a way forward. Yeah. Do you show readers in Hidden Pieces what he was like during happier times in his life? Was he more a social, had a lot of friends? Had a good, great sense of humor. Wasn't afraid of close relationships. Do, do, do you do you give readers uh, a glimpse of that part of Jax before <laughs> before the case, before his daughter passes? Do they get to see that Jax, and then they see him broken, and then they get to see him, you know, the restoration, or do you just start with him, just the brokenness? Yeah, I start with the brokenness, but you do get to see glimpses of who he was, not only through, um, well, through backstory to some degree, but through the eyes of of Abby, you know, because she knows who he was prior. But also his um, ex-partner, Jameson, he reaches out to him when things happening in the current case seem to be reflective of things from the old case, because there is a connection to all of that, of course. Wow, Um, And so you really get to see some of that through Jack, through Jameson's eyes, his ex-partner. Um, and he was never, he was always one that kind of butted authority. And that's partially from his backstory with his dad. Um, and so, you know, he was never one of those guys that, you know, just easily relaxed because he's always been a little bit hard on himself. But um, he was a different guy prior to the Lulu dying. Of course, he said he even marks it. He says there was the Jax before and the Jax who he was after. So a, it definitely a, changed a, him. Having a child pass, well, we, you can wave goodbye to the old you. That 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 for sure. Now, does does hidden pieces end on a cliffhanger? Don't want to give it away. 
And <laughs> for what if it does or doesn't, why did you choose to end the book without telling exactly how it ends? Just want to know if it ends on a cliffhanger. But why did you choose to end the book the way that it does end without telling us how it ends? Well, I will say that the current case does come to some kind of a re- resolution. Um, you know, I, I don't like cliffhangers in the sense that whatever the characters are working on is hung out too far out. <laughs> um, but I will say certain relationships are unsettled, um, and that's what propels you forward to the next to the next book of how things are going to ha- you know evolve. I think so. Not a real cliffhanger in as far as the case is. Um, and you do know that Jack has, you know, I move his arc. So, you know, from where he starts and where he ends, I think the, the reader is like, okay, the next book won't be, we're, he's not going to be in that spot, you know. And so we're going to, so I'm kind of curious to see where he's going now. So, okay. but things aren't resolved in other areas of his relationships. You know, you got to always have some some of that hanging out there. <laughs> How did you marry? Did you always plan to turn the book into a series? Was that initially from the word go your plan, or did, is that something that just sort of happened? Yeah, so I always knew Jack would be a series character. I mean, he just he has a lot of stories to tell, and I think as when you have a law enforcement guy, you know, of course you can keep writing indefinitely. There's always a new case, and as long as you can keep the character fresh and have his have them, you know, um, having something to work on. I think that that works great. So I I always envisioned it as a two-book series for sure. And then the third book kind of came to me in this last year, and I thought, well, this needs a third book. So I have a a great publisher, and they were like, sure, (laughs) we'd love that third book. So that's what I'm working on for that. But, yeah, I always knew on some level he would be – he would be a character. In fact, before I sold the hidden pieces, I had Deadly Tides half written because I'd already, you know, I knew the story that I wanted to write for the second second book. So now, before I'm going to start, and you just kind of uh, kind of uh, gave a warm opening into one of my next to next questions. When I'm going to start talking about Deadly Tides, but I want to ask you this: for people as a as a writer myself, people often say create a book series. If you create a book series and the characters are engaging in the storyline, and people keep wanting to know what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. They have to really care about the characters. You have to have one or two characters that they really, really care about. Um, you will gain more and more readers as you go along through the series, although sometimes readers hate for the series to end. But you'll gain more <laughs> and more readers. And then maybe while you're doing that back in the third book, you're working on another series to so just keep growing your your audience because you you, are you going to take it a series for 30 books it's going to end at some point but so i wanted to ask you how did deciding to make the story a series affect your writing of each book in a series do you think you would have wrote differently if you had approached it as a standalone versus knowing this is going to be a series hmm that's a good question. Um, well, I probably would have, if I'd have thought it was going to be a standalone, um, I I would have probably wrapped up the t- the ends a little tighter. Um, although I am kind of known for, I guess I guess I could say known for. I'm up to six books almost. Um, you know, I don't always like nice tidy endings because that's not life. <laughs> life doesn't always right. end up tidy. We don't always know what's going to happen. Um, you know, there's just the ambiguous of like, well, I think this could happen or this is the direction. So I guess if I was going to to do it, I might have come up with a few more, you know, um, t- you know, tightened ends. But other than that, the, I think it, each book stands on its own. So even when if the series were to, like if I were not to write a third book, these two would stand on their own and you could read them separately as well. Um, you wouldn't even have to read them in order, you know, so... I think that's important as a writer. I tend, even though I write series, I do try to make each book stand independently, so that you kind of always have a little bit of the backstory, and the current case, and then kind of the idea of what could happen in the future. Okay. Now, what's happened to Mary and Deadly Tides that causes Sh- Sheriff Jax Turner 
to, and you kind of alluded earlier, but to actually want to live again. What's what's happening at the start of Deadly Tides? Well, it's kind of interesting. I decided to start the book with Abby's perspective um, this time. And it's because in this particular novel, um, you know, they're – they're they're not back together, of course. They're still, you know, chatting and all of that. But there's some hope that maybe there's, you know, something going on that it could maybe eventually happen. Um, but Abby is looking for her mom in the very beginning of the novel. And her mom has uh, slipped away from the senior center once again. She has Alzheimer's. And anytime she isn't happy with the food or something, some interaction, she'll she'll leave. Well, this time, her mother's not in any of the usual haunts. So she's not downtown. She can't find her anywhere. And uh, when she finally does find her, it's it's not really a um, giveaway since it's the end of the first chapter. She finds her mom on the beach, and she's holding a severed foot in her hands. Um, I know. But it's not graphic, but, you know, she's holding that. Now, at the same time, Jax has received a welfare check. Uh, call from a, a concerned brother um, he, who's not been able to get a hold of his brother who'd called the night before, heard something in his garage. And so Jax goes up to the property to see if he can find this gentleman, and he cannot find him. Um, in fact, he sees signs that something has happened, but he doesn't know what yet. So we have a missing owner of a surf shop who happens to be a surfing legend, and then we have Abby's mom on the beach holding a severed foot. There's also a case happening in West Shore. There's another foot that has come ashore, another missing man. So we have Abby and Jax working on a case kind of together, but separately but together on this now, one. So it's what, what, one of the moving parts. Was Abby in law enforcement? Did, is that how she and Jack met? They both were in law enforcement and that's how they met? Yeah, so Abby's FBI, and Jack oh, was a right. homicide okay. detective in Portland okay. originally. Yeah. And then they moved what? down to the Oregon coast together. Ah, is she his first love? Is she? Did he have anybody in high school he dated, if he went to college, anybody that he dated that he just fell in love with? Or is Abby, like, the first time he ever was in love, is she, like, his first? Yeah, she's his first. I mean, he definitely had, you know, he was a young man in the military. So, you know, he definitely had his moments. But um, he did not fall in love until a little bit later. Uh, he was very work-driven, very career-driven prior to that. And um, and then he fell hard for Abby. And uh, she was a little bit younger than he is and um, about about 10 years younger. And um, But they hit it off and... They they moved and yeah so she he, to, for him it's the love of a lifetime and he knows what he lost when he screwed up he knows you know and you get to see that in him that he knows what he lost when he messed up and withdrew and cut her off and he's just mm. desperate to try to fix that on some level. How long were they married? Ten years. How long were they married and how long have they been divorced? When. We come into deadly tides. About five. Well, Lulu dies when she's five, and then he likes to say that you know their marriage died that day, but it took a few extra years to you know actually have it official. So they've been divorced about a year and a half, two years at the time that you that you meet them. Okay, and you said they were married how long? About ten years. Oh, okay. So they did have a a good yeah. long, okay, okay. Now who is? Because I was going to ask you why is he struggling? So he can't let his ex wife go because he is a, he's in a small <laughs> town. Maybe he should move to a bigger town. I know you got to get to keep the story and meet somebody else so he can just let go. But I was going to ask you that. But then I think do your answer to the other questions. She's this first real love. That's why he's he just can't let her go. And is uh, next question just for our listeners: Is his inability to let her go? And I wasn't necessarily going to ask you this. It's not a clinging, unhealthy, like no. really not a healthy. No. can't let you go. Okay, okay. No, now, no, no. He's not a stalker or anything. <laughs> uh, he's just, who is you know, he Sheriff? Just puts it out there. 
who is Sheriff Turner trying to bring closure? Who's he trying to help as it regards a crime in deadly tides? Who is he? Because I, I watch, I watch um, documentaries, true crime documentaries sometimes, and the you it, this is something that for some reason I don't know why I never thought this surprised me. I think like a detective is doing their work, uh, there's their case, it's their work. Like a physician is or a nurse, this is the patient I'm treating. But it, the, the, per, the 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 patient or the attorney you work at a law firm, they don't always see it. I think the way other people think they do. When I watch those crime documentaries. The detective will say, I wanted to help that family. I wanted to bring that family closure. I wanted to help bring that family peace. It's not like it's just a case that landed on my desk. Who is Sheriff Turner trying to help bring closure, some resolution to, as it regards a crime in deadly tides? You know, I think oh, it's a, that's a good question. I was thinking, you know, because the brother – in the case um, is not one of your warm and fuzzy brothers, you know, the, the one that is looking for his missing brother. Um, you know, I think in this particular story, Jax is trying to find the answers for the missing man who they do find because they find things that show that he has died, uh, but they haven't found him yet. And so he really wants to find, you know, he it, he's like he's the representative of the person that's been victimized. And that's how he kind of felt in Hidden Pieces as well. There was actually in the cold case, I, I didn't add that the perspective, second perspective in Hidden Pieces is the surviving girl from 25 years ago. Uh, and, and it was her sister that was abducted and murdered. And for him in that story, he's trying to find the answer for her. But in Deadly Tides, he's really trying to find peace for the for the victim because he believes you know that nobody should be lost out there and he wants to find out what happened um to the man and bring him back and bring him home and 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 bury him necessarily in fact i think the ending of deadly tides is probably the best end scene i've ever written to be honest and part of it is because um because I get to bring in some of the Hawaiian culture of my husband in the book. That's all I want to say. I don't want to go too far into it, but um, there's a certain thing that Hawaiians do when they bury their dead um, and the surfing culture. Uh, so it's probably my favorite ending of any book I've ever written. So, um, okay. But that's what Jax is doing, yeah. How's that for a tease? <laughs> so do, 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 uh, does he, he does get the personally involved with with his clients, it sounds like he does get personally involved. He gets does he get like very emotionally personally involved when he takes on cases. This is something I again I found surprising when I watched those documentaries. Detectives, some of them, a, a case will shake them to the point that they retire. They just can't forget it. Is he that way? I think it. Yeah, yeah. I think it drives him. I mean, it's definitely his drive is to get those answers. He is. He is involved in the case, and he believes that he's the one that can figure it out, you know, because he's got that hero complex again, you know. Even though it, it falters, um, ultimately he believes that he can he can find the answers if he just gets his head around it. And if he just drives harder, um, he, he'll be able to figure this out. And so he gets very involved emotionally, mentally, to the point of sometimes – not eating like he should, not doing the things he should be doing for self care, but not on not in a horrible way, but just you know it can wear on him if he's not careful. So, and that's what, what Trudy happened? like when I was talking about Trudy, she tells uh-huh. him to stop. So. Uh, what have readers been saying about hidden pieces and deadly ties? Well, I think what? they like it overall. Okay, <laughs> they 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 like Jacks. Um, I think that's the biggest thing I hear is I just love Jax. And, you know, he is, he really is somebody to root for. I mean, once you kind of understand who he is, you just, you kind of want him to win. He's just that, he's got a heart of gold. Um, and he would do anything for anybody. And I think that's why he, it, it's so hard on him when things don't go right. Because you know, ultimately, there's nothing he wouldn't do to to bring a child home, to to bring peace to somebody, to find the answers. 
And so you really want that for him. You want his. You want him to find his happiness. You know. Oh, uh, Jack. That's See, that's how that's a good series. Is the character that keep people want to know what's going to happen. What is going to happen to Sheriff Jack Turner? <laughs> Can you now please give us a, a brief synopsis of Don't Ask, Don't Follow? Well, this one was fun. So, you know, when you talk about series, I had a standalone idea. So I branched out and I decided to do a standalone. And Don't Ask, Don't Follow is the first one that I've actually set in a law firm. Um, which I thought, well, you know, after 18 years, I should probably bring that in as a setting <laughs> and actually do it. Um, but this one follows two sisters. Uh, the Beth Lawson works in their father's law firm. Um, and Lindsay, uh, she is an investigative reporter. And their parents are kind of, you know, they're very professional and very detached half the time. But Lindsay and Beth are tight. And... Beth has invited Lindsay to come to the Christmas party, and she's a no-show. And Beth is kind of over. She's a workaholic. She is over it, ready to go home. But when she runs back to grab her stuff, she sees her sister running out the back door. She's a little missed because she said she couldn't come to the party, and why is she there? And she run, walks into her boss's office to see if he knows why she'd been down running down the hall, and she finds her boss dead. <gasps> when she goes back to her office, she has a note from Lindsay, and it says, don't ask, don't follow. Now, Beth is oh her little gosh. sister. Yes, and she's been hearing, don't ask, don't ask questions, don't touch my stuff, don't follow me. She's been hearing that her whole life. Um, but now the police are asking questions. She can't get a hold of Lindsay. She's got this cryptic message, and now you know she's going to have to go figure out what the heck Lindsay was into and why was she running from a murder scene. So that is wow. the basis of the book. <laughs> oh, my God. It's going to leave love some dark, it. dark oh, places. Very nice. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, Beth Ralston works as a paralegal. So please right. tell us what, what, what is her personality like, Beth, and what, what, what's driving Beth? What drives her? Oh, well, what drives Beth for sure is her love of her sister. Uh, she, well, there's nothing she wouldn't do for Lindsay. Um, but she is a workaholic, and she's a good girl. She's very tenacious. She's, she's into the billable hours and, and setting the world on fire, but the way she wants to set it on fire. Her dad is always telling her, you need to be a lawyer, you need to do this, and she's like, I don't, I don't want the debt. He's like, I'll pay for it. I don't want the string attached to the money. Thank you. So she's very independent. Um, her and her sister are very much alike in that way. Um, but she's also a rule follower, and this, this really proposes – a lot of problems for her when she's being told not to ask and don't follow because she has to skirt, you know, she's having to kind of tell the detective, no, I don't know. I don't, I didn't see anybody else running down the hall. I don't know what yes. happened, but, but she did. And so it's really pushing against everything that she knows is right as a paralegal, um, as a rule follower. And so she's put into some pretty weird places um, on that, what they call that moral ambiguity line, <laughs> like what she, how far will she go to get to her sister, protect her, and ultimately try to find her when she thinks that something has happened to her. So. Oh my gosh! It's, now is Lindsay? They're both independent. These sisters, Beth mm -hmm. will do it. She's a rule follower. She'll do anything to protect her sister. I'm assuming Lindsay's the older sister. And mm -hmm. what 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 is Lindsay like? Does she play a heroine or a villain? And don't ask, don't follow. Well, she is a – she shapes, so where one follows the rules, uh, Lindsay looks to bend them all the way uh. <laughs> over. Um, she is the wild child of the family. In fact, you know, when this, the book opens where Lindsay is jumping out the window of Beth's bedroom to go meet a boy – and, you know, and telling Beth to hide it if dad comes in. So, you know, Beth has been covering for her sister for a long time. <laughs> this is a new. Mm. Um, but Lindsay is, you know, she takes on a lot of causes. She, you know, she can be at a sit-in for the environment. She looks to right wrongs in the world, um, but usually on an environmental level. And so, you know, she's got a heart of gold. She just goes about it. In fact, there's a, they have a whole conversation in the book about, you know, we want the same things. It's just that Beth thinks that 
you know, the best way to do that is become a lawyer eventually and work it from the court law, from the law side. And Lindsay's like, no, 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 you need to be loud and proud. And that's how you shake up the establishment. So, but ultimately they want the same thing. They want change. They just go about it very differently. Um, so, yeah, so that, you know, they're very, very opposite of each other in a lot of ways. How old are they? Because when you said that they're jumping out the window, I'm thinking they're in their early 20s. How old are they, and do they live together? They don't live together. Um, the opening scene is when they're 12, or when she's uh, 10 and 13. So they're three years different. And then you're fast-forwarding up to 20 years. So they're 30, you know, 30 and 33, oh, I believe, okay. in the book. So, okay. Yeah. Is that the way when you describe her... Is she up to the task? Is she really up to the task of investigating what happened to the manager? Uh, without giving a story away, but is she is she really the way she currently is, or is she really going to have to undergo a lot of transformation? Is she really up to this task of investigating yeah, um, what, you this, know, what happened? Yeah. So I think. She's up to the task of trying to find her sister because ultimately that's what she's looking for through the book. Um, she is leaving the, the actual murder investigation slightly to the detective. Um, but, but when he starts thinking maybe Beth is involved and then Lindsay's involved, you know, her goal is to find Lindsay and find out what's happening. And what she finds is that Lindsay was doing some investigating and that she may have been working with Beth's boss in order to do some of this investigating. And so when when it comes to the work of paralegal, you know, you're doing a lot of research, and there's some of that that's at play here, that she has to dig into some different things. Um, and, and so she actually has the skill set to get it done, which was partially why I wanted this character to be in a law firm and to have that background, because I think it's actually perfect for what, what she had to do in this novel. And, and it works. So she, she don't ask them yeah, follow this 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 is this the one that comes out June the fourth? It is. Yes. Oh my gosh, we getting a treat. We are getting a treat. <laughs> it's just like in, in less than two weeks. Don't ask. Yes. Don't follow launches. What are you doing for your book launch for our listeners who may be in an area where you're doing book signings or you're, you're going to be doing some type of a of a launch event, uh, what are you doing yeah. at launch? Don't ask, don't follow. Yes, I'm doing a couple of things. I've June fifth, I'm actually doing a book signing and a launch party down at Copper Bell Bookshop in Ridgefield, Washington. And then on June fourteenth, I'm going to be in conversation with another author at White Oaks Book in Vancouver at six thirty that or at six o'clock that night. Um, so I'm doing some live launch events. I'm doing um, the night before book launch with Vanessa Lilly. Um, and so that one is going to be on Instagram. And so, you know, I'm just doing some of that type of stuff. So I'm excited. A lot of, lot of hope, busy work. <laughs> I hope you have an awesome book launch. Look for it, you guys. Don't As, Don't Follow by Mary Kelly Koa. And it launches June the 4th, and if you're in the area, you can attend her June the 5th uh, book launch event. When and why, we're coming down to just about seven minutes left in the day uh, show, when and why did you start writing on the books in the P.I. Kelly Pruitt series? <laughs> oh, well, that that was inspired a lot by Sue Grafton. I loved Kinsey Milhone. I I just enjoyed reading her, you know, the way she had created a private investigator. And so when I started wanting to write, I thought, you know, I, I want to create my own little um, CI as well. And so I kind of made her a little bit different. She was a single mom to a deaf daughter. She was recently divorced. She lives in her childhood home because uh, she'd come back to live with her dad uh, after the divorce. But that house happens to sit next to her ex mother in law, and so she has a lot of um, a lot of drama going on around her all the time with her ex husband trying to tell her how to pay a parent, 
with her ex-mother-in-law. Her father has recently passed, and she's inherited her detect- his detective agency, of which she worked in as well, but not as a full-fledged investigator, more as an assistant. Um, and so that's why I just thought it should be a great character to explore. I had a lot of fun with her. And Derailed is the first book in the series? It is. Yes, it's derailed, um, and that's the one that had you had talked about that was nominated for the Seamus uh, Lefty Agatha and Anthony. Goes, Thank you. That was all for best debut. I was very excited. I debuted during the pandemic, 2020, <laughs> so it was kind of a weird year, but um, it was awesome to get nominated. Oh, that is so good, so good. Now, what? What? I have so many other questions I wanted to ask you, but won't get to them all. But I do want to ask for our listeners, particularly for those who also are writers who would like or who would perhaps like to write a book themselves, what writing process do you follow, Mary? Do you use outlines, character sketches? How do you start to really sink into a story? Well, I am a what they call a pantser. Um, So I don't do a ton of outlining before I start a book because – Sometimes I just have the idea, the concept, and I have the character. Like I know I know a little bit about who they are, and I, I kind of know where I want the story to go to the end. But I just start sitting down, and I, and I spend a lot of time in my head before I ever sit down to write. But when I get into writing process, I write every single day. I write from like about 7.30 in the morning to about 10.30 or 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm a morning writer. Um, and I just... I just keep my fingers moving and my brain seems to kick in and it comes into things. It finds ideas that I would have never thought of if I sat there with a pen and paper. Um, and I just get it down onto the, to the page and sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. I usually reread my work the next day, kind of edit what I wrote and then move it forward after that. So I never know where the story's truly going to go. But sometimes it's really fun to, that way. I'm I'm surprised, like the reader, <laughs> sometimes. So, so, that's so my how process. many hours? How many hours a day? Again, are you writing? Probably three. Have, you know, pretty okay. three to four consistently. Yeah, every wow. day. Uh, I think that's a lot. Even, I, well, uh, I I can write maybe three hours, and then I'm. It's just I start to feel tense. Uh, maybe I'm getting so into the story. I need to step away. <laughs> I can come back to it. <laughs> And, 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 yeah, that's the way for, for me. Um, please share three to four steps, Mary, that you have taken personally that you have found to be effective at getting the word out about your books. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, talking with, you know, in, in these time formats, of course, are great and so appreciated by us. Thank you so much, Denise, for doing these types of events. Um, That's first and foremost. Second, you know, word of mouth, right? Being friends with your bookstores and your librarians um, and handing them a copy of your book and that, you know, that's going to certainly get um, them to read it. And then if they like it, you know, there's no higher, um, higher type of thing than getting somebody to talk about your book. And if they love it, you know. People will take that as a recommendation much over an advertisement, I think, than anything you could do. Um, And then just being active on social media. I do a lot of that. I do Facebook and Instagram and that. And I I try to um, talk with my readers. And a newsletter. I also do a newsletter. I would say that is also really effective. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Where can all the shelf listeners get copies of your books? I'm pretty much you know everywhere you could look, uh, or you can order it from your bookstore. But if you go to my website, um, I have all the links there from even my local bookstores to all the online sources um, that you could find. And it's also if you sign up for my newsletter, you can keep apprised of what's happening, what's new. My agent is shopping a new book now, so you never know what what new stuff might be coming out in the future. And, and definitely, the third book in Misty Pines will come out next year. Oh, my goodness, we have had the absolute pleasure of having Mary Kalia Koa on Off the Shelf Books today. I know you all enjoyed her. If you came in midstream or near the end, no worries. After the show finishes streaming, you can go back and listen to it in the archives as many times as you like. We're on so many platforms where you can listen to 
off the shelf. And if you enjoyed Mary, then share, share, share the link to today's show and so other people can enjoy it as well as you. And I encourage you to uh, get a copy of Mary's book. She's Hidden Pieces. It's a part of a the Misty Pine series, Deadly Ties, and a standalone, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Follow. And she's working on a new book now, but Don't Ask, Don't Follow will launch on June the 4th, which is just a few weeks away. Please visit Mary online at Mary, uh, M-A-R-Y-K-E, L I I K O A dot com. Again, that's M A R Y K E L I I K O A dot com. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mary, for being here with us today. And I thank all of our off the shelf books listeners for being here with us. Please come back next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Just set your calendar. Tell book lovers everywhere to catch off the shelf at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday morning. And as I always tell you, you're amazing, you're awesome, you are incredible. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. Mary, I will send you a link to the show when it finishes streaming. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Take care.